If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open it up to Hebrews chapter 4. There's one in the seat in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take that home with you because we want you to have the word in your hand. I love this book. I love this study that we're in. I'm so grateful Pastor Jeff um, it opened this to us. It's one of my favorite, if not my favorite books in the Bible. I told you last week you can sum up the whole of Hebrews in three words. Jesus is better. And Pastor has themed this draw near. It's like this book is full of invitations to understand the betterness of Jesus. And then it says, come near to that. Come near to that. We, we've been pulled into his voice. We've been pulled into our Savior, our Apostle. We've been pulled into the one with great salvation. And, then, and, and last week I talked to you about how we're drawing near to his rest. And that powerful passage where God reaches back through the author of Hebrews and gives us this history lesson of the Israelites who didn't enter the rest. And we ended at verse 11 with that concept that the reason they didn't enter this incredible rest, this Sabbat rest, is disobedience. This morning we want to learn what was it they didn't accept from God that we can accept from God, that opens the door into his rest. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. I want you to stand with me for the reading of the word this morning. It's a very short passage, but we love to honor the word of God in this house. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by, this, by some, the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I love what our liturgical brothers and sisters do at this point when they say, this is the word of the Lord. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you that you are the word Thank you, God, that you speak. And when you speak, we live. Holy Spirit, I have no capacity to open this book without your presence. You wrote it. You authored it. And we need you to interpret it, to understand it, even to receive it. So, Holy Spirit, we lean into you today and ask you, Give us open minds and open hearts and open mouths to receive your word. And when we leave this place, Jesus, I pray for a new fire to be in our spirit for your word that is alive and active, even in these moments. We ask this for the sake of your name and your kingdom. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I'm the youngest of five siblings, and a couple of summers ago, we celebrated our middle sister's uh, 50th wedding anniversary. So we went to Tennessee, and we had this party at um, my my niece's house, my sister's daughter, and lives in a beautiful house in a wooded area. And they had plans on their back porch, huge, fancy back porch to have this beautiful celebration. And my older sister, who's a party animal, she had all this beautiful stuff prepared. And she got over there to set up, and she had in her mind where she was going to put the celebration cake and all of that stuff. And she got there, and she went to that corner, and my other sister had a little decoration table sitting there in the corner. And in one of the decorations, a bird had flown in and not only made a nest, but laid her eggs, and they had hatched. So they're baby birds in this decoration, right where my sister wanted to have the big celebration table. So they quickly recouped and moved things around, and they just left the little bird alone. That's an actual picture of the birds. 
all through our party that day, they squawked and squealed and made all kinds of noise because they were hungry. But mama was afraid to fly in and give them food because of all the people on the back porch. So this went on most of the day. And by the end of the day, they were deafening with their squeals. They were wondering, where would mama go and why ain't we got no food? When, when the party was kind of winding down, people were going into the house. My little then eight-year-old granddaughter was with me and we were walking and we were the last two to go in. And she looked up at me with this really worried expression and she said, Papa, do you think the mama bird's going to come back or do you think those babies will die? I said, I, I think she'll come back. We walk in, we close the door, and I turned and looked back out the window, and immediately Mama Bird flew in and sat down, biggest old worm hanging out of her mouth, ready to feed those babies. And in that moment, Holy Spirit started showing me some things from that parable. You see, the babies were in a place where there wasn't an absence of food. We had, I don't know, 50, 60 people there. There was a veritable feast on the same porch as their nest. Problem wasn't that there wasn't enough food. It wasn't the right kind of food. And in fact, if we'd have felt sorry for those little baby birds and started crumbling things up and feeding them, we may well have killed those babies. So as frustrated as they were, as hungry as they were, as much as they were protesting their per current condition, they needed to wait for mama to come back with the right kind of food. Listen here. The food from the place they would one day live. I had this image in my head of these birds once they grow up and they're out in the woods there and they pick up a juicy worm and they go, oh, wait a minute, I remember this taste. This is what mama brought us when we were in the nest. You see, they needed to taste the food of home even though they'd never been home yet. So for them, when Mama Bird flew in, a couple of things happened. First, she quelled their appetites. They finally got some food. But the other thing she did is she calibrated their appetites. She gave them a taste for the food they would thrive on the rest of their lives. Anything less or anything else would have been the wrong kind of food. So she was giving them a taste for home. I want to suggest to you that the Holy Spirit's primary purpose is to bring to us through the word of God taste for where we're going. Food from the place we were designed and made to be. Literally a repast from heaven. Every time we hear the word. You see, what we, re we talked about last week was that the Israelites didn't enter into a promised rest because they refused to embrace and receive the word of God that gave them the promise of that rest. And because of their disobedience, even though they went in the land, they never went into the rest that was supposed to be there. And the author of Hebrews warned us last week. He said, don't be like that. And in that 11th verse, he says, let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. You see, the key that kept them from reaching the rest, the Sabbath rest that God designed for them was disobedience to the word that God had spoken to them. I, I, I talked to Pastor Jeff about this this week because it's an interesting concept and I wanted to make sure that he didn't think I was flying off the edge. So we chatted about this for a while, but the word of God that the author of Hebrews is talking about here can't simply be the written word. See, they have the Old Testament scribed, but the New Testament as we know it didn't exist. In fact, the author of Hebrews is writing part of what became the New Testament, and I don't think he had a clue he was doing that. Most of these people that were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, they were just writing to the church in that critical moment, helping them establish what the kingdom of God was going to look like on the earth. 
and the things that they would look forward to in heaven. So he's writing scripture. So they have the scrolls of the Old Testament, but they have none of the New Testament. It's not canonized for 300 years after this. So the word of God, while it included all of that, the word of God was so much bigger. I like to think of it, the word of God is multidimensional. If you look at the Old Testament, yes, we had it scribed down, but remember, they were scribing stories that happened, and in the story that happened, they didn't have the book we read. So they were hearing God through signs and wonders and miracles and all kinds of voices and crazy things that happened in nature. They were hearing the voice of God because God speaks in so many ways. We're so blessed that all that got written down for us. So we don't have to stand up there wondering if that cloud up there, is that God or is that just a cloud? We have the word scribed for us. But all of that emerged through the lives of people who were experiencing the word of God through the voice of God. Because the voice of God is what speaks to us. And it's interesting, like the Trinity, the Word of God is multidimensional. You have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I started thinking about it. You know, John tried to put it in words, and, and the more he wrote, the more confused he makes me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you're like, huh? And so I thought about it for a while, and I thought, what is this author of Hebrews referring to when he says, the Word of God? Well, God spoke. That's the word of God. In fact, God spoke, and everything we see came into existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit brooded over the darkness, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. In fact, Psalm 33 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. So God speaks. In the Jewish mind, when a word is spoken, it now has independent life, and it contains within it the capacity to accomplish what's in that word. So God says, let there be light, and that word, light, has the capacity to create the heavens as we know them. So God spoke. But we human beings have a hard time hearing. So God showed. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory of the only Son of God, full of grace and truth. God says here, let me show you what it looks like for my Word to live in your world. And he sends Jesus, who is the word, the spoken word, made flesh. Jesus was the perfect example of a person who lived in every detail of his life, the utterance of God. But beyond that, God didn't just speak and he didn't just show, he scribed. I love this scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness for the man of God to be complete, equipped for every good work. When you hold this, you are holding the breath of God. We, we can't have just an academic approach to this so that we can dot all the I's and cross all the T's. When you open this, God breathes. That's the living word of God. God scribes it, and it becomes our authoritative understanding of the mind and will and understanding of God in reality. And all the other ways that God speaks filter through the sieve of the Scripture. We have something where we can test what we hear so we hear better. We no longer have the capacity to see Jesus. He went back to heaven and sent us his Spirit. But we still have the capacity to hear him in his word and through his word in all the many ways that he loves to speak to us. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. God speaks through the heavens. 
But all of that filters through the Word. So when he says the Word of God, is he saying it? God spoke, or is he referring to when God showed, or is he referring to when God scribed? The answer to that is yes. The Word of God is what God says. We have the result in that when God speaks, things happen. We have the reality in that Jesus came and showed us what the Word of God among us looks like, but we also have the record, all of that scribed out for us in this blessed book. We just have to remember the Word of God has a voice. The Word of God has a voice. All Scripture is God breathed. How does sound happen? Breath, through your vocal cords, creates sound. Breath creates word. God breathes, word comes into life, and what he speaks happens. I have a friend who said, God did not write a book and go mute. In other words, God still speaks to our hearts. Ever been reading a passage in Scripture, and it's like, this thing happens, and you're reading it, and you're like, I never saw that before. I've read this Bible 500 times. I've never seen that before. That's the Spirit of God illuminating the Word of God. It's coming to life for you. I, I want to suggest to you that that should be normal. That's what God intended. That the Word would have that kind of impact in our mind. See, the Word scribed is about the author. I have a friend that said, this is the only book that the author shows up every time you read it. So as I look at this, and I understand, okay, the, the author of Hebrews is saying the Word of God, he's got this big concept in his mind of God speaking, God demonstrating, God scribing all of this out for us so we have this pure understanding of who he is and what he intends in the earth. But listen to how he says that the Word of God is, not was, not will be. The Word of God is always present tense. It's always relevant. It's not passe. It's not out of date. Let the culture say what it may about it being a 2,000-year-old document that, you know, it doesn't have any meaning. It's just a religious book. God breathed this book, and it is. Every day when you get up in the morning, the Word of God is. Always present tense, always now. I, I, I've heard people say, oh, give us a now word. There you go. Knock yourself out. It's always a now word because the word of God is. And then the author of Hebrews begins to unpack it. And he says two things that I think are really critical for us to understand about this word of God, which if we receive and embrace and believe, we will enter his rest. First, he talks about the nature of the word, which is to create. God speaks, stuff comes to be. I, I got to thinking about what Jesus said one time to his disciples. He said, my words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. In other words, when I speak, Something happens in the spirit that brings you life. One time Jesus was talking to the disciples and Peter looks at him and he looks at Peter and he said, are you guys leaving too? Everybody else is leaving. Are you guys leaving too? And Peter says this, we're not leaving. Where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, when you talk, we come to life. The word of God, the nature of the word is that it creates. He says the word of God is living and active. It's interesting. The Greek word for living is a derivative of the word zoe, which is always used for spiritual life. It's, it's, it's used of Jesus at his incarnation. It's used of Jesus at his resurrection. It, it, it literally means breathing or living or pulsating with life. 
So it's heaven's kind of life. The word of God is heaven's kind of life. This is not a dead document. This is a living, breathing organism of the kingdom of God. When you open it up, life pours out to you. The word of God is living. Jesus said we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. Peter, I think he was looking back to that time he had that discussion with Jesus. In 1 Peter 1, 23, he said, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. In this book, is life. It pulsates with the life of heaven. He also says it's active. The Greek word is where we get our word energy. So the living word of God has an energy to perform itself. So in other words, the life that is in the book is supposed to create something in us when we read it. When I read it, I live. When you speak, I live, Peter said. It's active. It's, it's, it's a power and an energy that has the capacity to create. So it's heaven's kind of power. So when you open this book every single day of your life, you are opening a book full of heaven's life and heaven's power. In other words, you could read a verse on any given day that could change the rest of your life. One verse, one word. Because the life of God is within it. I know it's hard for us to understand. We we don't think of inanimate objects as having life. These are pages and type and, and they're letters and words and paragraphs. But they were breathed from the very heart of God. And men and women so believed in it that thousands of them died protecting this book to make sure we had it. And hundreds of them have been interpreted it over the years to try to make sure we could understand what this book says. Why? Because in it is the life of God that creates within us the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. I love the NLT. The word of God is full of living power. So he talks about the nature of the word. It's alive and it's active. It carries the life of God and it carries the power of God. And then he turns to what it does. This is the nurture of the word. If the nature of the word is to create, the nurture of the word is to change. Now, I grew up in a fire-breathing, you know, fire and brimstone kind of preaching. You, I know that shocks you, but I did. And every time preachers read this verse first, it always scared me because I saw it as a threat. But as I've studied it the last few weeks, I understand this is a promise. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the very intents and thoughts of a man's heart. That scares us. Because it sounds like God's just coming in and... And cutting everything out of us that shouldn't be there. It's not at all the picture. But what it does tell us is that the Word of God works. The Word of God acts. The Word of God accomplishes. Listen to Isaiah as God speaks through him. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that for which which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. That should make you read every promise in the book differently. Because he said, none of them will return to me without accomplishing what I sent them to do. When I was a little kid, we used to sing a song, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, 
I am living in his love divine. Because every promise in the book is mine. The word confronts. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharper, interesting word. It's a word that we almost can't translate how sharp it's trying to describe. You would think of a sword as being sharp, but not being precise. But this is a precision sharpness, like a surgeon's scalpel. It's sharper. The word about it is sharper. In other words, it cuts as intended without unnecessary damage. Like a surgeon's scalpel. The Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It's the kind of sword that they used to do hand-to-hand combat with. So the Word becomes, in God's hand, the thing that He does, hand-to-hand combat with the stuff in us that would kill us if He didn't deal with it. It's literally, it's a very interesting Greek word. It literally translates like this. It's a two-mouthed sword. Two-mouth sword. What is two-edged, two-mouth? What does that mean? It means it can cut in grace or it can cut in judgment. The difference is how we receive it. The voice of that word can speak grace or it can speak judgment depending on how we receive it. It's the same word, but it cuts differently depending on the posture of our heart. Revelation 1.16, John saw the double-edged sword coming out of the mouth of the Lamb of God on the throne. And it's interesting, he says, that double-edged sword, that precise, sharp sword pierces. And that word's interesting, too. It means pierce to the very point it needs to go to, like a surgeon cutting down just deep enough to open you up and take out what is destroyed. It pierces to the dividing. It pierces and lays you open so that God can deal with what needs to be dealt with. If the Word of God never makes you uncomfortable, it's not piercing far enough. I don't know about you, but there's times I'm reading the Bible and I just go, you know, I'm going to come back to that next week. Because it starts piercing to the point of dealing with the stuff that needs to be dealt with. Listen, guys, we don't just read the Word of God. It reads us. We don't adjust the Word of God to what we think is true or right. We align our understanding of reality to what the Word says. We don't use the Word to confirm our ideas. We adjust and calibrate our thinking to what the Scripture says. The word confronts, but then it cleanses. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, thoughts and intents of heart. It's interesting. People see that as fearful, but for me it's such hope that God is so precise, he will come with his word, speak directly to the thing that if left in me would infect and destroy. And he will pierce right to that point and remove that, cleansing it, sewing me back up to heal. Now, some of you probably have never had major surgeries, but I had one 30-something um, years ago where they cut me. I've got a scar, runs across like they ran a skill saw through me. I thank God for that scar every day because if it weren't for that surgery, I would be a dead man. I thank God for every time the word confronts me and says, Michael, you need to make adjustments to this book. Align yourself to this reality. His word transforms the tangible and the intangible parts of us. It divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow, the spiritual part of you and the natural part of you. He touches all of that. And he is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's an interesting word. The Greek word is kritikos. What do you hear in that? Critic, 
critical critique. God's word is a perfect critique of your natural and spiritual life. And he knows what to address to bring you into alignment and calibrate you to the heart of God for your life. And that's the last thing that happens. The word calibrates. See, the, the target of the word, by the way, is the heart. He says he, he deals with the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's, God's focus is always on getting our hearts. But when he does, he calibrates them to the kingdom. This part really interests me because this verse is probably one that's used more to scare people than any verse around. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. But he is naked and laid bare, and I love the King James, to the one with whom we have to do. And I thought about that this week, and I thought, I don't think he, the author of Hebrews is trying to scare us. He's encouraging us to enter into God's rest. What's he saying? He's saying this word hidden is really interesting. It has to do with the image we first produce for people. He's saying God will not deal with your masks. The word of God will not stop at the image that we portray. But it comes behind that image because God will only deal with us authentically as to who we are. So you can put out your image and people may stop there, but the word of God goes behind that image. Nothing can hide behind a mask in the face of the word of God. And in fact, we are naked and exposed, laid bare before God. That's the part that bugs us, isn't it? But I thought about it this week. That was our first stance before God in the garden. Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed. So here's what I'm hearing him say. The word of God will penetrate into your heart to do the necessary repairs so that you can stand in the same original innocence that, that Adam and Eve did, naked and unashamed before the God who has done his work to redeem you. Wow. He sees us more clearly than we see ourselves. And therefore, he knows how to shape us so that we become what he envisioned that we would be when he knit us together in our mother's womb. So here's the thing. This word will work to bring us into that rest we talked about last week, that Shabbat, that Sabbath rest, that's a different kind of rest from anything we know in the earth. You'll enter into this place of being naked and unashamed before God if you allow the word of God to do its work. Don't run from the sword. Don't push back from the scalpel. Let him go far enough, deep enough to deal with the things in you that need to go so that you can experience the beauty of just being before God. I love this book. I've studied this book for 50 years this summer. I've read it from cover to cover in so many translations, I couldn't name them all. I read every day four different translations of the, of the Bible. Why? Because I still don't understand it all. I still don't get it all. There's still, every week, things that God deals with me in through the Word. There are still things that I'll read, and I'll read it again and again and again, and all of a sudden the lights go on, and I'm like, whoa! Because the Word of God is deeper than the deepest caverns of our being. You can dive into it again and again and again, and you'll never plumb its depths, and you'll never understand all of its richness. I have a couple concerns for us in the modern church, especially in the Western church. One is that we take a stance of cold academic intellectualism with the book. As if we feel like if we memorize it, if we, if we read it methodically, if we do all of these things, which are all good in, of themselves, but they're not enough. The other stance is the haphazard way that so many people 
treat the word, they just flip it open on a day and they'll read a verse or two and that's, that's all. And they think that somehow is going to do it. And I always go back to the little birds in that picture. That's what I want God to see every time I open this book, Wally. I want him to see that little baby bird down there with his mouth wide open, squawk and say, I need the words of eternal life. I need whatever you breathe this to me to get into me. I love the story of the road to Emmaus, the disciples walking with Jesus after he's resurrected. And they ask him, as we often do, stupid questions. And one of those is, are you the only guy around that doesn't know what this is about? Yeah, I'm him. And it says that as they walked along, he opened the scriptures to them. So all the way on that eight, nine mile walk, he taught them of himself through the written word that they had. Think about this though. They get to the house and it says they did not recognize him. The word of God was teaching the word of God. get it? The word that had been made flesh was teaching the word that had been written down and they still couldn't hear it. It took an encounter with his presence in a room where he broke the bread and they went, oh, that's what we were feeling when we were hearing him speak the word to us. Did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us on the way and he opened the scriptures. I knew something was happening there as he was telling me who he was in Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy and Chron. I, I, I knew what he, there was something going on, but I didn't see him, even though the word of God was teaching the word of God. But when I saw his presence and he broke the bread and I realized it was him, the word he had spoken to me came alive. Heart burned in that room. If I can ever bring a challenge to you, family, our hearts need to burn once again for the Word of God. You cannot navigate this culture, you cannot navigate this world without the living breathing, active work of God, doing surgical work on you on a daily basis, cutting through to the places that need to change, calibrating your life to his kingdom vision. You cannot exist without it. Any more than those little birds could have made it much longer without mama coming with the food from home. In this book is the food we will eat for eternity. It calibrates your taste for the home you have not yet inhabited. Papa, I thank you that you are not a God who hides. You're not a God who leaves us to figure it out on our own, but you speak. You spoke, you speak, you will always speak because you are the God who was and is and is to come. But I thank you so much that you didn't leave us in the dark to try to figure it out. You gave us the plumb line. You gave us your living, active word that breathes the very energy of heaven into us. Jesus, I say to you like Peter, I don't understand what you talk about sometimes, but where else could I go? You have the words of eternal life. Papa, forgive us when like the people in Malachi's day, we open the book and we yawn at this precious truth. Would you ignite a new flame in us? Would you ignite a new desire in us? to dive deep into your word, not just to know it in our minds, but have it pierce our hearts so that we are aligned to everything you are and all that you desire. Holy Spirit, would you flutter within us and awaken desire? 
renew and reignite a love for your word and your voice. Lord, if we've neglected the word in any space, forgive us and stir us. For your word is alive and active. May we receive it as nothing else so that we may enter your rest. In Jesus' name. Those of you who don't know, this is Reverend Wally Schilling, and he um, is part of our pastoral teaching team, and he just feels that he has something that God wants him to share right now. Last week, when Michael gave the word about today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Open up your hearts. Enter into rest. Don't just hear the word. Because it didn't help those that heard it, yeah. but didn't mix it with faith. It's a very subtle but monumental difference. Yeah. And I wrestled with whether I should say something last time. As some of you may know, sometimes I've given a word when I feel like the Lord is speaking. And, and, and I didn't do anything last week. And then as I was home this week... I realize, well, Michael's going to speak again this week, and if the Lord speaks to me, I can say something this time. So here I am, and, and what I want to say is, what I want to do is, I want to give us an opportunity to respond, I mean, literally respond to the Word, whether the Word was burning in your hearts last week when, when Michael was speaking, like it, it, the Holy Spirit was burning in my heart, or whether he's burning in your hearts this morning, or whether there's only a little teensy flicker or heat that kind of has to still get to cooling temperature. So the point is this. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, please. And we're going to pray. And I'm not, I don't want to pray for you, per se, but I want to guide you into you personally praying and asking God to do, by his Holy Spirit, whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you so good. for him to do. So today, because last week was today then, but now today is today. And this is today for you. This is your moment. This is whatever God is doing in you right now. He knows. We don't know. But he knows. And because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and can pierce to the dividing of bone and marrow, it can pierce to the thoughts and intentions of your heart. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you've been thinking the past week. He knows what you were thinking when you walked in. Yeah. And he knows what you're thinking right now. And he also knows not just your thoughts, but what are your intentions? What are your motives? Do you shortchange yourself by pursuing rest, not in him, but rest in alcohol? A little buzz, a little more than a buzz. Do you run to alcohol to find your rest? Do you run to lust and look at too many things you shouldn't look on when you're going through your phone and you see stuff that they just present you and you have a choice? Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Are you going to click on that? Are you going to look a little more? Is that where you're going to find your rest, your pleasure, your peace? Do you look for what you're going to purchase on Amazon Prime? Is that your rest? What is your rest? Your rest is to be Him. Him. The Word of God who is speaking to you right now. The Word of God who is present right now. The Word of God who is in your heart right now. So I'm going to shut up and ask God. I'm going to shut up and talk. I'm going to shut up and just ask you to seek the Lord. Let's go. Father, we just ask right now that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, each one. You can be so personal and individual to each one of us in this yeah. moment at yeah. the same time. And I ask that you do that, Lord. Open our eyes to see you right now in us, speaking to those 
thoughts we had when we came in today, to those temptations that we know we've resisted and given into this past week. Lord, you have grace upon grace for us. And I ask right now that you say in your heart of hearts, come Holy Spirit, speak to me, Lord. Speak to me, Lord. Reveal to me what you want to reveal. Show me what you want to show me. And Lord, I respond right now. And just in your heart of hearts, say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I repent. I ask your forgiveness for that sin. I ask your forgiveness for being disobedient. I ask your forgiveness for not mixing faith when I knew I should have to your word. Lord, I look to you and to you only. Strengthen me from this day forward to choose, to enter, to strive, to enter into your rest by resting in you and not resting in the things that I think give me rest. Oh, Lord, I don't want to shortchange myself anymore. Come and fill my heart with your presence right now, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Just in your own heart of hearts, Holy Spirit, move on each of us. Fill us. Strengthen us. Empower us. I want to ask you to now be seated, but stay in the same spirit. And I, we're not going to move on quite yet. I want you to just have some time in your hearts to just process what God is saying to you right now. And I want you to finish it before we move on, at least. Just do your business with the Lord. Mix your faith with the word spoken this morning. Do you not know that I am all you need? You do not need anything but me. Turn to me. Trust in me. Receive me. Rest in me. And I will give you rest. Do that thing that you just asked me to do. I have forgiven that sin. I have buried them in the depths of the sea. I will answer your prayer. I will set you free. I will do that thing that you just asked me to do.
So we're going to do things a little bit differently right here. So the media team, just follow me. Talk about prayer every week. And God sort of laid this on my heart. We just talk about prayer. If you need prayer, just send in a prayer request. I want to tell you what your prayers are doing and what your prayers have done. Several weeks ago, we prayed for Rosemary White because her husband, John, had fallen here at the church and he had his head. Took him to the hospital. He was fine. All of a sudden, he started having a brain bleed and they rushed him to ICU. We prayed for him on Sunday. Two days later, he was home. Praise God. Last night, um, I got a message. I don't know if you know him or not. Many of you do, but uh, Bob Hesse, Robert Hesse, comes to the service, sits in the very back. On Monday, he was walking into his house, and he fell over the step. And he broke his hip. Tuesday, they did surgery and fixed his hip. Last night, I got a message, and it just said things aren't looking good. And they were thinking about doing some medical treatments to prolong that he wasn't willing to do. So we prayed for him. And I went over and I prayed with him last night. And this morning, I got a message as uh, Chris, our children's director, his daughter, went to see him. When I got there last night, instead of doing the, the prolonging procedures, they put, it's like a CPAP machine, but it was like a full face, like you're a full face scuba diving mask that was forcing air to keep his oxygen levels where they need to. And they transferred him to ICU to monitor him. It was just, they said, it's the best we can do. This morning, he's on just the nasal cannula, and his oxygen levels are 99 to 100%. That's why we ask for you to tell us what your prayers are. That's why we ask you to let us know how we can pray for you. Because if we, if we pray for you, if we know what God you need God to do in your life, then we can partner with you. Because our Bible says where two or three are gathered, and I think we got more than that, that he will hear us, and he will answer, and he will do. Sometimes it's not exactly the way we want it, but he will. Something we learned at VBS, and we taught, and it was our student message last night, it talks about that no matter what you're going through, it will be okay as long as you have Jesus. It will be okay. But also Jesus can calm the storm. And that's what we've got to hang on to. So that's what our prayers are doing. Our prayers are touching families that need hope that needs something to hang on to. And that was the one thing when we got there last night, is the family felt relief. At that, that moment, nothing was changing. It was still exactly what they said, waiting for that bed to take him to ICU. But they had hope that even if it didn't end up the way they thought it would, if the unimaginable happened, they had hope because this family was praying for them. And was standing beside them. But that hope turned in this morning to something much better than that. Because Jesus can calm the storm. I think we're just going to stop right there. And let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. As Michael has talked about, that Jesus is better. Jesus is everything. Jesus is 
everything, and we need to get that into our hearts and into our minds and into our lives, that no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, no matter what's going on, that Jesus is everything. And as a body and a family, we unite together. We come together as a family, and we pray together, and we weep together and we mourn together, and we grieve together, and we celebrate together. And that's where we find our victory, through your word, and through what you've called us to do, is to come together as a body of believers and unite. In your name.